All right, so we are still looking at uh, conservation of energy for rigid bodies. So let's look at this one. We've got a 10 kilogram homogeneous disc down here, uh, and it's attached to a five kilogram rod AB. So we haven't done one like this where we have two objects that both have mass. Um, they, they're connected together. The assembly is released from rest when theta is equal to 60 degrees right here. Uh, determine the angular velocity of the rod when theta is equal to zero. Assume the disc rolls without slipping, neglect friction. Okay, so a few things here. Um, we need to visualize where it starts and where it ends. Do you see that it starts right here in this setup right here, and it ends when this theta is equal to zero. This has gone down here. It ends down here uh, in this setup. It's very important to... Uh, to think about where it, to visualize where it starts and where it ends because sometimes the figure just either gives you where it starts or the figure um, kind of gives you an in-between. But here, <clears throat> there's where it starts, pink. There's where it ends, blue. All right, uh, but then the other thing is when you have two objects, that's fine. You still only have one conservation of energy equation. One conservation of energy equation. And it's still just the potential plus the kinetic plus any non-conserved work equals the potential plus kinetic. Uh, and then, you know, each of these now, remember, has two different terms that we could have. Potential due to gravity, potential due to a spring, uh, the linear kinetic energy, the rotational kinetic energy, F, D, M, theta, and so forth. Gravity, spring, linear, rotational. All right, so now, if you have two objects that both have mass, then any time you have an M in the MGH, uh, then just, just have two separate MGHs. Don't try to find the center of gravity of the, the two of them combined. You know, you could find some... Um, Use a, a weighted average, use a centroid to find the uh, center of gravity between the two centers of gravity. Uh, but just keep them separate. So have, have an MGH for the bar, have an MGH for the disc. Um, for the spring, doesn't affect that. You know, if there's one spring, then have a 1 half kx squared. There could be two springs, have 1 half kx squared and 1 half kx squared of each of the springs. Um, this, I don't think, has a spring at all. Uh, but anyway, anywhere you see an M, uh, so the one half m v squared. We'll do the one half m v squared of the rod, plus the one half m v squared of the disc. Also, anytime you have an i, the i, the rod has its own i, the um, disc has its own i. One half i omega squared. One half i omega squared of each of those. So it's really almost like you have uh, double of um, a lot of these terms. Uh, the MGHs, the one half MV squares, and the one half I omega squares. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm gonna write. You, you probably don't have to. You probably don't want to write this whole uh, equation, uh, but I'm going to. I'm gonna say the one, the sorry, the MGH of the disc plus the MGH of the rod plus the one half kx squared of any spring. The, there, there is no spring here. Uh, plus the one half m v squared of the rod, one half m v squared of the disc, one half i omega squared of the rod, one half i omega squared of the disc. Now, are there any f d's or m thetas? Are there any external forces drawn on here? Any external moments? Um, no, no. I mean, any some, some forces I'm looking for. Our forces drawn on there, forces in a rope, um, also forces due to friction could be there. Any moments drawn on here? No. We don't have any of those. All right, so all of that on the left-hand side equals all of that final on the right-hand side. I'm going to, actually, before I do that, I'm just going to remind myself, um, let's do the um, rod and the disc, right? The the velocity of g of the rod, velocity g of the disc. The i g of the rod, the i g of the disc. All right, kind of remind myself. All right, this is the rod, this is the disc. This is the rod, this is the disc. All of that initial 
equals all of this final, right? All this at the initial uh, pink location equals all this final at the blue location. Okay, but a lot of this is probably going to be zero. Probably going to be zero, right? Okay, if the assembly, yeah, to, to, to release from rest. Release from rest. So that means both of these velocities and both of these angular velocities were zero, right? If it's released from rest, the rod's released from rest, the disc is released from rest as well. Okay, now let's think about this MGH. First, I'm going to start thinking about this MGH of the uh, disc. Remember, this is point G, point G. This is all point G of the disc. Point G would be right here. Of the rod, point G would be right here. So of the disc, G would start here and G would end here. Do you see that, that, that doesn't go anywhere, right? We can call that our zero location. Okay, but yes, for the rod, uh, I am going to have a height, right? This is just our vertical height, G, of 0.3 sin 60. It begins at 0.3 sin 60. It ends down down here at zero okay let's go ahead and write that so m so this is only the um mgh of the rod the rod is five kilograms 9.81 uh, 0.3 sine 60 equals that's the only thing we have on the left hand side that the, all of the energy is in the potential energy in the rod does that kind of make sense right starts from rest the, and the disc had no height, and there was no spring. So now, let's look at the right-hand side of the equation. The final, um, final part of our um, our equation, our final energy. So here, I've got the, the kinetic energy in um, the rod, the kinetic energy in the disc, the angular rotational kinetic energy of the rod, rotational kinetic energy of the disc. Um, for a second, let me just let me just put all that down here. Duplicate that. Put it right here, and let's talk about it. Let's think about it. I definitely have too many unknowns, but um, you know, a, a lot of times, like. Let's think about the rod first. The velocity of point G of the rod, the velocity of point G, uh, and the angular velocity of the rod. Um, the velocity of the rod is probably related to the angular velocity of the rod. So let's look at the rod. Um, velocity G of the rod is probably to the angular velocity of the rod. If I knew the distance away from the center of rotation. Uh, well, where's the center of rotation? Uh, this rod is not in pure rotation, so it doesn't have a, a good, clear center. I've got to find the instantaneous center. All right, so where's the instantaneous center of this rod when it's down here? Uh, well, this point is going that way. This point is going that way. I draw those dotted lines. Can't forget instantaneous center. Yeah, so right here is the instantaneous center of zero velocity. So point G would be point 3 away. So VG of the rod equals point 3 omega of the rod. So that's what I'm going to plug in right there. 1 half <clears throat> M of the rod, 5.3 omega squared. And let me go ahead and say 1 half. I, okay, I of the rod is 1 12th M L, the total L squared, omega squared. All right, but then what about the I of the disc, the omega of the disc, the velocity of the disc? Did you see that I just said that the instantaneous center right there was zero. The velocity right here is zero. What does that mean for this disc that is rolling? <clears throat> it has rolled as far out as it can. It is not going any further. Um, 
I know the instantaneous center of zero velocity of a wheel that's rolling without slipping is here, but if the velocity at the center is also zero, this wheel is at zero. This wheel, its um, angular velocity of the disc is at zero. The velocity of point G of the disc is at zero because I knew from the other object that the velocity of that point was zero. This is kind of a special case, right, where that 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 disc has has rolled as far to the left as it is go as it is going, and it has to stop. It can't go any further, uh, so that, that has a velocity zero. So this this um, equation really boils down to very simplified five nine point eight one point three sine sixty is equal to this. The only unknown is the omega. That's the omega of the rod. So the omega of the disc is zero. The velocity of point G of the disc is zero. But the omega, omega of the rod is not. The omega, omega of the rod, I've got 6.52 radians per second. 6.52 radians per second. I can visualize that it is going clockwise. Okay, so let's take a step back and look, look back at this problem. Even if we weren't in the work energy uh, section, we would have known we should use work energy, you know, with things that are released from rest, with things that we're trying to find the angular velocity at, one, at starting point to ending point. If there's no collision, remember we can't use conservation of energy if there's a collision. You know, we would use um, conservation of momentum. Um, so conservation of energy, you know, I write that long equation. I think about all the potential and kinetic energy. Uh, think about any external forces that do any work or moments that do any work. Uh, and then it really simplifies down. When you have two objects that both have mass, just put two MGHs. 2 1 half mv squared, 2 1 half i omega squared in there on both left and the right hand side of our equation. Okay, and then don't forget this, you know, a lot of times we've been doing this, finding, hey, uh, where's the instantaneous center so that I can substitute v equals r omega. r is not necessarily the radius. Many times, yes, it does end up being half of the uh, length of the object, uh, but that r is the distance that your point G is away from the instantaneous center. So you can plug that into the, your velocity um, and solve for the omega. All right.